William Beveridge, Sir William Beveridge, was president of the society from 1941 to 1943. And um, if you haven't seen them, the, the boards of the presidents of the Royal Statistical Society are quite extraordinary, going back to the Marquis of Lansdowne in 1834. Sir Rawson Rawson, he's my favourite, and, um, and, and Harold Wilson and all sorts of people. And, uh, but uh, during the war, the interesting period actually was just during and after the war when Sir William Beveridge was 41 to 43 and then the Lord Walton, 1945 to 1947, saved the country through, through rationing. Um, he was an economist, Beveridge was, advisor to Lloyd George, former director of the London School of Economics. And in 1942, he published his uh, landmark report that created a blueprint for the UK's welfare state. And he recommended that the government should find ways of fighting the five giant evils of want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. We should all have to repeat these every morning, I think, and get them all off pat. Want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. The British wartime government at that time that commissioned the report was a coalition with members from the Conservative, Labour and Liberal parties. But Beveridge's masterful use of statistics convinced people of all political persuasions to the macroeconomic benefits of a welfare state. An extraordinary thing to actually carry out in 1942, which really was you know, pretty well the low point of the war for us. At the Beveridge Memorial Lecture, we try to carry forward this legacy promoting the value of statistics to a wider society. And this year, our lecturer is Will Moy. It gives me a huge pleasure to, to introduce him. Uh, Will, many of you will know Will, he's been the director of Full Facts since 2010, in which he's had to endure three referendums, the Leveson Inquiry into Press Standards, the European Parliamentary elections and you know, very notable 2015, 2017 general elections. So all sorts of fun and facts to check. Um, Will's a Marketing Academy scholar who appears regularly on TV and radio and at events to discuss full facts, worked and fact checks, as well as he's given evidence to the Leveson Inquiry and select committees and so on and so on and so on. Before full fact, Will worked for the non-party affiliated peer Lord Lowe of Dalston and Parliamentary Advisory Council on Transport Safety. Um, it gives me you know, real personal pleasure to introduce Will because um, i am you know, come into this area of what Hans, the great Hans, Ros late Hans Rosling calls factfulness and how important that is for society. And um, I, I'm interested in this and you realise you appreciate in this country we've got a, a very good ecology for this. Um, we're with uh, help from the Royal Statistical Society, charities such as Science Media Centre, Sense About Science, but at the core of this has become, I think, full fact, and will in particular. He's done an enormous amount to um, improve and to constantly urge the importance of impartial but accurate facts, particularly based on statistics. So um, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Will, and uh, there will be time for questions afterwards, which I'm sure you'll be very grateful to take advantage of. So I'd like to introduce Will Moy for this year's Beverage Lecture. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a huge privilege to be asked to give this lecture, to talk to this audience, um, and to address the underlying subject of the value of statistics to society, um, which could not be more pressing and urgent right now, um, as I think we'll see as we go through. But let's step back from that for a second. Let's think about ourselves, which is the other side of this story. Whatever the value of what we know, the value on the other side matters to what we do with it. Do you ever wonder about where you would have been back in the days of Columbus and Magellan? Do you ever wonder whether you would be that person on the boat striking out into the sea to find out whether there's something over the horizon to see when you might hit land? Do you think you're that explorer? Do you ever wonder if back in the days when these islands we live on were still covered in woods and forests, you would have been the person staying close to home, staying close to your campfire, or the person going to the top of the hill to see what's over the horizon. It seems to me we live 
at a time where we are open to the most exciting exploration that perhaps has been available in history. Now the question is, would you go to Mars? Do you want to be one of those people to get on the spaceship, be the first person to set limited foot on Mars? Are you that explorer? But actually, there is an undiscovered country so much closer to home. And though it's not the bottom of the ocean, the cliched answer to that question, it's us, ourselves, and the way we live together. And suddenly we live in an age where we can learn more and more about ourselves and how we live together than we ever have before. We live in an age where maybe we are beginning to hit the brow of a hill of knowledge about society and beginning to see different opportunities for what that tells us about how we organize society. And that is thanks to statistics. One of the people with that kind of exploratory mind, perhaps uh, more keen to explore in a library or a carefully controlled field group than out there on a boat in the chilly cold and wind, uh, was a man called Gabriel de Tard, um, a French uh, sociologist, as we would now call him, um, who in 1898 wrote this wonderful passage and this wonderful question, which has haunted me ever since I first read it a long time ago. He said, in grand language, when we traverse the gallery of history and observe its motley succession of fantastic paintings, when we examine in a cursory way the successive races of mankind, all different and constantly changing, our first impression is apt to be that the phenomena of social life are incapable of any general expression or scientific law, and that the attempt to found a system of sociology is wholly chimerical. But the first herdsman who scanned the starry heavens and the first tillers of the soil who essayed to discover the secrets of plant life must have been impressed in much the same way by the sparkling disorder of the firmament with its manifold meteors, as well as by the exuberant diversity of vegetable and animal forms. The idea of explaining sky or forest by a small number of logically concatenated notions under the name of astronomy or biology, had it occurred to them, would have appeared in their eyes the height of extravagance. And there is no less complexity, no less real irregularity and apparent caprice in the world of meteors and in the interior of the virgin forest than in the recesses of human history. How is it then that in spite of this changing diversity of, in the domain of sky and forest, among physical objects and living beings, we have seen the birth and gradual growth of the sciences of physics and biology. Statistics underpin them to a significant extent, and statistics allow us to see the real regularity behind the apparent caprice in human life for 2.4 children, the seven-year itch, the fact that some vaccines and some treatments work. And when a centenarian gets into the local paper and explains that the reason they've lived to 100 years old is their daily diet of whiskey and cigarettes, it's probably not reliable health advice. Suddenly we have this explosion of data about our lives that allows us to find much more regularity, much more order, in our societies. Data now isn't something that we just go out and collect as members of this society have spent years doing. It's something that happens by accident with every conversation we have, with every movement we make, with everything we do on our phones and our computers and increasingly in public space. And so we are all potentially explorers. We live in the most exciting time in human history to understand the most exciting subject of human study, which is each other. And that's one beginning of this story. That's one reason why, full fact, we have a better option than ever before. There is another beginning of this story, too. The search for knowledge in itself is not that interesting. It takes more than just knowledge. It takes driving force to take knowledge and do something useful with it. And every now and again, a giant steps into the public arena and offers answers and not just questions and not just observations. And William Beveridge was one of those giants. His report called for the government to provide support for people from cradle to grave to tackle the five giant evils which we must recite, want, 
disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. His report led to the national health, to the national insurance, to social security. That is a legacy. And the answers that Beveridge offered have lasted. We have probably all been affected by them. This year in the UK, for example, we, subject seven, we, we celebrate 70 years of the NHS. Not a very long time ago, and in many places still, I would have been a member of that awful statistic, infant mortality. I have a lot of reasons to be grateful for the NHS, though in my job I should stress that there are many other ways of organising a healthcare system. <laughs> Five years after the Beveridge Report, and 4,000 miles away, in what was seconds away from becoming an independent country, Nehru said, the service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty, ignorance, disease, and inequality of opportunity. The greatest, man of our genera the greatest wish of the greatest man of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but as long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. I first heard this quoted by Ben Gomes, the Vice President of Search Engineering at Google, as an inspiration for his work, bringing better information to the fingertips and lips of billions of people. And we are all part of that ambition too, to bring better information and so, in some small part, to relieve the tears and suffering of our fellow citizens. And if you only look at the extraordinary rise in life expectancy, the extraordinary fall in the number of children who do not reach their fifth birthday around the world, you realize that in the long run, perhaps, ignorance killed more people than ever poverty, idleness, want, and squalor did. And that, for me, is why full fact exists. To do a modest part of the work to make each of our fellow citizens' experience of life better, to relieve suffering where it is identifiable and solvable. It's very easy to get into an abstract debate about misinformation, and I'm about to do it. Um, but it's important to remember that underlying all the choices we make about what information we share, what information our governments rely on, what information they try to promote and what information they try to dissuade people from sharing, our choices about your lives, choices about my lives, and choices about the lives of everybody in this country. We are dealing with real issues here. Let me talk to you a little bit about Full Facts experience tackling misinformation over the last eight years and the role Full Facts has played. And then I'll talk about the place we've got to in the debate about misinformation in this country, which is fundamentally asking some misguided questions um, the need to be clarified and straightened out and moved forward from. And then I have four challenges I want to put in front of us where I think we are missing the boat of using information well in this country and then leave us with two challenges where I think we have not yet found good solutions to the problems in front of us. Full Facts spends our days doing something very simple and very modest. We listen to people in positions of power saying things that are important and we ask them where did you get that from what's your source is that true can you back it up my colleagues some of whom are in this room make terribly polite phone calls to members of parliament and government ministers and government departments and journalists and say i'm sorry you said that publicly could you explain where you got it from and some can and some cannot and when they cannot we ask them to correct the record. And from all of this, we generate an evidence base. Where does nonsense come from in public life? And what can we do about it? So our first service to the public is fact-checking. It's a service directly to the people who use our fact-checks, millions of them every year, who come to full fact to find out whether they can rely on the things they've been told by people in positions of power over them. The second service is the simple fact of ringing them up. A number of times we've been told nobody else was asking for a copy of the survey. Nobody else wanted, us, wanted to know how we did the calculations. My colleagues, uh, Grace and Claire, spent about two weeks on the phone to the Bank of England a couple of weeks ago simply trying to get 
the source of essentially one number that had splashed all, all over the headlines. If you were wondering whether you were actually going to lose out 900 quid from Brexit, nobody else was doing that legwork except my two colleagues, Grace and Claire. We call this the they know we check effect. And we've seen time and time again that the knowledge that you will be rung up and asked to justify what you say in public changes the behavior um, of people in positions of power. And over time, we found that civil servants in government departments we were checking were having key performance indicators set for their job reviews of not being found to be wrong by full fact. <laughs> We could use a few more key performance indicators like that in government and in a few other places too. So we serve our audience. We hopefully deter people from playing tricks with the truth. And finally, we learn, perhaps more than anyone else does, on a specific day-to-day -day basis of where misinformation comes from and what can be done with it. And then our impact team, Cassie and Phoebe as it now is, take over and they go and ask for corrections. It's an interesting experience. I think most people assume that the reaction would be universally hostile. It's not. I remember in the very early days of Full Fact, Trevor Kavanagh, the chief political correspondent of The Sun, perhaps the most powerful political journalist in the country, spending all day going back and forth over email with one of my colleagues when Full Fact was something nobody had heard of, uh, to justify a figure he'd used and the calculations he had done with it. He had no need to do that. That wasn't an important thing to him. There was no threat to him there. He considered it was important to justify the information he was giving. Serious people in politics and journalism think that politics and journalism are important and deserve to be done well. Similarly, we've had a prime minister have to publish a correction on the official record of the House of Commons after making a mistake in prime minister's questions three months or so after that Prime Minister had invited a member of the uh, Labour Party to go and read full facts and find out why they were wrong. It's nice to be relied on in both directions. So lots of people are positive and constructive when we engage with them and seek corrections. Not all are. One Cabinet Minister's response to a correction request from full fact was described by the Financial Times as a spectacular piece of bullshit not language I usually associate with the Financial Times, but they had a point. And so when we find that not everything goes our way, we have to say, well, what's going wrong here? What is it about the system which is, which is allowing misinformation to spread? And so if you find that a whole series of cabinet ministers are failing to correct the record when they're obliged to, where in the system can you make a change to improve that? Our job is to gather the evidence to go to the House of Commons, to go to the Backbench Business Committee, the Procedure Committee, and to show them that they have a problem and to encourage them to change it. That approach has led us to doing everything from uh, persuading the Daily Mail to set up a regular corrections column, to working with official statisticians to communicate their work more clearly and cut out regular uh, front page newspaper misunderstandings that were directly caused by the ineffective communication and statistics by the Office for National Statistics itself. When you do enough of this work, you find places where you can intervene in the system and genuinely improve the flow of information. But still you're left with that awkward question. What happens when you get spectacular bullshit instead of a constructive response? What happens when, as in the first set of corrections we did, a government body, it was Ofsted, the uh, school's inspectors, simply refuses to go on the record to correct a universal media misreporting of one of their reports for fear of offending the journalists they work with. Um, cowardly, for sure. A dereliction of their public duty as public servants, obviously, but they felt comfortable doing, with it, doing it. We have to establish a culture in our public life where there is an understanding that being honest to the public is a first-class obligation of all public servants, of all journalists, dare I say it, of all businesses, of all charities. And we are a long way from doing that. That isn't just work for full fact, that's work for everyone in this room and far behind. So as you can see, full fact works on several levels, from our daily journalistic work through to large conversations about how the world should work and how and institutions' roles within that. We largely work to affect the behavior of powerful people. 
um, and we work in a very political environment. And so it's important, I think, to say that facts are not a substitute for politics, despite what some people say. Politics is what happens when two people look at the same set of facts with all the uncertainty that might include and apply different values, priorities and appetites to risk to those facts. The cross-party board of trustees at Full Fact is a good example. If they talk politics, which thankfully is not their job for us, they wouldn't agree on very much. Yet they all recognise that every political co conversation is better founded on reliable information and that is why they support Full Fact and they volunteer to do so. Policy, on the other hand, can be values-based as well as evidence-based. It can be the least worst of bad choices with constraints you cannot disclose. Facts are not enough, but we know that ignorance kills. Even reality doesn't sell itself without clear, believable, penetrating and persuasive communication. And that's the job of Full Fact, to make sure that there is effective communication of what we know about what's going on in the world. And so we come to the last couple of years, and we can observe the moral panic about fake news, which is prompting frightening overreactions by governments and potentially internet and media companies around the world. The people with the most power to damage open societies are the people who already have power. On the other hand, we can see that misinformation and disinformation represent real risks to open societies. There is evidence of state actors running concerted disinformation campaigns. It would be surprising if commercial ones weren't doing the same thing. The true impact of these threats is not well understood. It goes beyond politics and democratic debate. Some of the clearest evidence of harm from misperceptions is in public health. We talk about vaccines. Amid all of this, our world is changing. We can no longer rely on the four or five TV channels that some of us maybe grew up with, the ten newspapers, where you knew what you were getting because you knew the source of what you were getting. People are having to deal with the proliferation of sources and it becoming increasingly hard to place trust reasonably. And that leaves you with two bad choices. One is to distrust everything or the other is to trust things only from known sources and to miss out on the richness of the information age we're now part of. So one of the questions we're now grappling with is how do we give people better ways of placing and withholding trust when it has to be done quickly and it has to be done with unknown and unfamiliar sources. And while this is already starting to be true, for most of us, television is still our main source of news. The world hasn't actually changed that much yet. This world is the world that's coming to us. So in the light of all of that, government is gearing up to act, which should fill us all with a feeling of reassurance and joy. <laughs> government is gearing up to make sure that we are not misled. And when democratic governments decide to uh, make sure that citizens are not misled, that is obviously very reassuring. Um, but actually, government in this country has so far taken a very careful approach to this topic. They are taking their time to study it. They are working to define carefully what they mean. Governments in other countries have already started to or actually passed laws criminalising the spread of fake news with huge powers shifting to, if you're lucky, the judiciary and possibly the government. This is a global conversation and in some places the consequence is the retreat of a democracy and the rolling back of open societies. So in the coming weeks, Full Fact will be publishing our take on what this policy conversation looks like. And we're going to express basically three elements of what we think a sensible response might involve. The first is we need a risk-based and proportionate response to real threats. It is very easy to wave the flag of people being wrong on the internet and think that that justifies government responses. But actually, we need to better understand what harms are involved and what the scale of those harms is in order to work out what is a proportionate response given the interference in people's speech, people's expression, people's ability to receive information from other people. 
The second point is that notwithstanding the fact that governments should be extremely cautious in this area and should be primarily concerned with protecting free speech, there are some things that government can do now and should do now. There are some things that can and should only be done through open, democratic, transparent processes. Some of you will have seen Facebook announcing new ways of uh, increasing transparency of political advertising online. And good for them, it's an important question, and it needs somebody to make the first move. When on earth did we start thinking that a US technology company was the right player in British democracy to change the rules around election campaigning? Clearly this is a role for Parliament. Clearly it is a role for democratic, transparent and open processes. And yet our Parliament is silent on this topic. Our election law is almost daily becoming more and more out of date and more and more dangerous simply because of the inaction of our Parliament. Some things need to be done in democratic processes and Parliament should stop shying away from its duty in that area. And when we come to talk about the extraordinary p potential power of highly targeted advertising, which cannot be seen other than by the people it is targeted at, we need to recognize what advertising looks like in this day and age, which is real time, generated, potentially customized to each individual viewer, targeted based on things about your browsing history, things about your life that you would not necessarily know are not private information. The idea of publishing an archive of this stuff in a way that is not machine readable some days or even weeks later is so far from the reality of real-time computationally generated advertising that it doesn't belong in this conversation at all. And yet if we do not act and if Parliament does not raise the game, that is what we shall be stuck with. Finally, we are asking for a principles and capabilities based approach to the future, by which I mean it is very easy to ask what I think is the wrong question. What should we do about Google, Facebook and Twitter? It might not be Google, Facebook and Twitter in five years' time. It's not even Google, Facebook and Twitter now. Google has seven or eight products with a billion users a month. They're not one thing and they're certainly not just a search engine. And if you want to understand what a good and effective response to misinformation online looks like, what we need to understand is what are the capabilities that are changing the world we live in and what principles should be applied to those capabilities so that when new players come into this space, we have a system that is capable of working with all that change rather than having to be reinvented to try to keep up with the far more inventive technologists who are driving this change. So three things, risk-based and no overreaction, open, democratic, transparent processes for things that need to be democratic, like political advertising, which is an urgent problem. And finally, a future-proofed approach that is based on principles and capabilities. And that last thing is something we have seen proven before. Uh, the Institute for Government has actually just published a report highlighting the effectiveness of human fertilization regulatory system, which was based on profound thinking about the underlying principles turned into law and then turned into effective regulation. That is the kind of model we need to see in tackling online misinformation. But let's get real. Someone being wrong on the internet is just simply no kind of threat to you compared to your prime minister or your leader of the opposition being wrong about you. People with power over your life are far more important to you than strangers on the internet. And if they are misinformed, if they are, dare I say, ignorant, then your life could be a lot worse very quickly. So how do we cure ignorance among the blundering giants who potentially might be running our country and among our fellow citizens? I'd like to um, highlight four things that I personally have observed um, through my eight years working at Full Fact. The first is that government consistently and terrifyingly chooses ignorance when it could easily choose information. Nothing has made this so obvious to me as learning that we have better data on how many people play golf than we do on how many people are victims of crime. 
we run a massive local authority level survey called the Active People Survey to guide our investment in promoting sport. I think promoting sport is great, and if we're going to spend a lot of money doing it, then let's spend it well, let's inform ourselves, let's find out who wants to play golf, and let's make sure that we're telling them where the golf club is, and running, and swimming, and all the rest of it. But surely, 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 if we think it is important to invest in understanding how to promote sport, then surely we think it is important to invest in understanding how to reduce crime. And yet, the Public Administration Committee did an inquiry into crime statistics and asked why we have a crime survey that does not actually provide us with crime data down to the level at which we elect for people responsible for dealing with crime, i.e. our police and crime commissioners, it would cost about £18 million to fill that gap which is a drop in the ocean of a police budget, which, by the way, we have no reliable numbers on what we spend on police. I would give you a number if it was easy to find, um, but it's not that easy. But it is a drop in the ocean, which leads you to wonder, who is it that thinks that not spending a tiny proportion of your budget on knowing what you're doing is a really smart use of other people's money? And the answer is the people who run the country. That worries me. We are, at the moment, beginning to embark on an extraordinary time of opportunity. Brexit will mean rebuilding government systems from the ground up in certain areas. And it gives us an opportunity to invest in building systems that can leave us much, much better informed about the world we live in and what we can do about it. At the moment, we are stuck simply a year, a year and a half, two years behind real events, waiting for the results of official statistics to eventually tell us how life used to be. Really. The number of data sets where we say the latest data, if you look on fullfact.org, the euphemism, the latest data, which can mean anything back to, you know, 2015, sometimes worse, is deeply deeply depressing. We live in the era of real-time information. We live in the era of individual information. We live in the era where every transaction is a record and a piece of data, and we wait two years to have a clue what's going on. Now, there are times when that's appropriate. There are times when, actually, the survey method, which does take time, which does require that rigor and discipline, needs to be waited for. But there are times when it's just because we haven't built the systems properly to give us better options. Given that we are about to embark on rebuilding our government systems, isn't it time that we baked evidence in at the beginning of building that system? Evidence by default. Is it going to happen? Government is busy. They've got rather a lot on their hands at the moment. Unless we can make that case powerfully and vocally, so that it becomes a high priority for them, then probably not. And because those systems will last 20 or 30 years, we will still be left in ignorance about, for example, how our immigration system works and whether people are coming and going as we think they are. That's a heck of a thing to choose. So we need a new national commitment to stop flying blind, to stop choosing ignorance, to rebuild our systems to provide real-time individual level, transaction level data to inform proper decisions in the service of the public. And then we need to use that data well. There seems to be a debate going on at the moment in our research councils, which are spending money on things like understanding healthy aging. And the debate runs something like, let's give all the money to the medics. Let's spend the money on hard science. And absolutely, we need to spend money on hard science. We need to spend Probably more money on hard science, I might think, if I thought things like that. But we also need to spend money on understanding how people use the system, understanding what are the barriers to accessing system, understanding why people never get there in the first place. It's no use having the best medical technology in the world if the people who would actually use it aren't turning up to the doctor. And so we need to invest in understanding society and not just building new systems. All of this goes to the architecture of government, which is repeatedly choosing ignorance. So that's the challenge as I see it for 
government. The challenge for statisticians is really hard. And it's about the questions that statistics chooses to ask. When John Pullinger gave his presidential address for his, this society, he made an important statement of the value of statistics being in the service of society, that the reason official statisticians count things is to serve society. And he stopped short of directly addressing the power that gives to statisticians and how that power is used. Andy Haldane, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, did an amazing thing after the EU referendum. He gave a speech called Who's Recovery, in which he talked of visiting a community centre in Nottingham with half a dozen local charities and community groups, not the kinds of people that the Bank of England hang out with. And he said, I began by speaking about the UK's economic recovery. I never got as far as the improvement of the jobs market or surging confidence. I was stopped in my tracks by a forest of furrowed brows and a phalanx of probing questions, not all of them gentle. What exactly do you mean by recovery? One asked. My charity is dealing with 50% more homeless people than three years ago. Every other charity in the room had similar stories to tell. Whether it was food banks, mental health problems, or drug addiction, all of the numbers were up. The language of recovery simply did not fit their facts. Andy Haldane takes that interaction, and in, in his speech he goes on to argue persuasively that we are over-reliant on big-picture information about the state of our country. Aggregate measures like the size of the economy, the gross domestic product, and average measures, what's happened to average earnings, that we're not looking at, actually, if we have a recovery in the southeast, do we have a recovery in the northeast or not? We're not breaking things down far enough. I thought that was an immensely thoughtful speech. I recommend it to you all. I'd like to extend that argument to suggest that even the choices of what we count and how we define it deserve much deeper conversations than we routinely give them. I've become just increasingly uncomfortable with answering important public questions by going to the official data and saying, here's what's going on. I think the most obvious example is employment. We have this jobs-based recovery. Except that whenever you say that to somebody, they say, well, what about the people who are working part-time when they want to be working full-time? What about the people who are on zero-hours contracts? What about these rubbish jobs? What about the polarization of the labor market where it's easier to get a low-paid job or a high-paid job, but the middle might be being hollowed out? Those kinds of questions. And actually, the employment rate doesn't do much to satisfy people with those kinds of questions. Is it actually useful to talk in terms of employment in the way that we have for so many years? Well, the answer is obviously yes. Those definitions are useful. They're comparable. They're internationally comparable and standardized. They tell us a lot about the world. But the answer is also perhaps no. They don't tell us enough about the world. Stat statisticians who I have heard on occasion decry the press are the only group of people outside of the media who I know to use the term headline proudly on their products, the headline statistic. This is the size of the economy, this is the level of employment. And actually the headline statistic might just be the thing that's killing us. I think it might just be the thing that is actually a really unhelpful contribution to public debate at some times. Rather than prioritizing, here is the one figure that tells us what's going on, can we start making more nuanced judgments about what we're counting and how we're talking about it. And so we move away from those big macro numbers, the size of the economy, which is a very debated idea as to what that really measures and whether it re represents the value of an economy. Employment, where the nature of employment is becoming the battleground of debate. Baby names. This is the, uh, the release for our Office for National Statistics considers to be just fun. You know, this is their lightweight hit in August. Has no political significance, does it? Except that if your name happens to be Mohammed, it has quite a lot of political significance because the Office for National Statistics has made the decision to count up names by how they are spelt. 
which means that Muhammad, which can be spelt in many, many different ways, transliterated as it is originally from Arabic, gets counted as lots of different names, which means that it doesn't look like Muhammad is the most common name in the UK. I think the uh, most common name is Oliver from memory, uh, which really only has one spelling unless you're very pretentious. Um, <laughs> But if we were to do it by what does your name sound like, which seems equally valid to me, and no, no more right or more wrong, people called Mohammed are actually might, might turn out to be the largest baby name. And every year, people who have a particular point of view on the immigration debate point this out and feel that ONS is deliberately hiding an important story about how our community and how our country is changing. And I'm not sure they are deliberately hiding it. I think they've just missed the point. And that worries me actually far more. Um, we need to get to a point where we are willing to understand the full complexity of these kinds of choices and willing to share them and willing instead of making statisticians make these choices and then hide these acts of power away from the public for the statisticians to actually give power back to the public and start saying there are different ways of looking at this and this is what your options look like. I think it's time we became more careful in considering definitions and what we choose to measure. There was a French sociologist called Pierre Bourdieu who did a whole set of work around going and talking to people in places like housing developments, uh, which in his words bring together people who have nothing in common and force them to live together, either in mutual ignorance and incomprehension or else in latent and open conflict with all of the suffering this entails. And he argues that it's not enough to explain each of their points of view separately, that all of them has to be brought together in reality and be shown how they butt up against each other and be shown that there are tragic consequences, in his words, of making incompatible points of view confront one another. And our statistics do the opposite of this. Our statistics create these universal definitions of what the world looks like and hide all of that subtlety and all of that conflict under the neat definition of employment or immigration or whatever. He argues that we need to replace this single, central, dominant, in one word, quasi-divine point of view that is easily adopted by observers and work with, instead, the multiple perspectives that correspond to the multiplicity of coexisting and sometimes directly competing points of view. It's a long way away from how we think about the role of official statistics right now. More recently, Matthew Powers and Vera Zambrano have been looking at the way researchers study journalism and political communication between countries. Most often they do it by counting things. Less often they do it by going and describing what's happening in different countries through case studies and fieldwork and qualitative research. And they give an example about how, uh, studying how personalized news is in different countries, studying the extent to which news is focused on individual politicians as opposed to political parties or other actors. And they define a definition of this and how to count it. They define a set of causes which might be about the types of media outlets or the types of political environment. And this study found that the UK and Italy share the highest level of personalization with three quarters of political actors in the news being individual politicians. And apparently it was a really well-designed study. What the researchers did not appreciate is that the data misrepresents what's happening in Italy. Because in Italy, the law requires news outlets to, requ to permit equal time to politicians of different parties, and thus drives them to having more individual politicians. And that was never part of their model. So that explanation was never considered. The argument that Powers and Zambrano is making is that this universal universalist model which defines a set of statistics, a set of statistical definitions, and tries to apply them in different contexts and different definitions is valid and important. It's an important way of being able to generate comparisons and comparative data, but it's not enough on its own. They're arguing for a contextualized approach. 
which tries to actually bring in the fact that different definitions apply in different places. The fact that possibly what being employed means in different parts of the economy or different sectors of the economy might mean something different suggests to me that that lesson applies much more widely than in the study of political science. So I have a question, uh, particularly for the statisticians in this room, which is, is there such a thing as a contextualized version of statistics? And are we missing it from our official statistics? Because I, for one, am tired of telling overly simplistic stories about the society that I am trying to empower people to be citizens within. So for me, the consequence of this for official statistics, one of them must surely be to question our reliance on headline figures. The second is maybe that we look across the Northern Ireland, something which the English could be accused of doing too little of, and have a look at the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. Is it actually time that we brought together statistics and social research as ways of insight into social life and recognise the richness that can be brought to statistics by following up with more qualitative questions. It's completely routine, of course, in market research, in lots of political research. Can we do more of it in official statistics and official research? Could our ONS become our body that just is charged with understanding society with every method available to us? I'd like to think it could. I'd like to think we could be that ambitious, that we're not so wedded just to methods, but actually to the outcomes and the service of society. I was, it may seem something simple, it may seem something difficult, I don't know, but the thing that most struck me about Bourdieu's work was his translator's comments about one of the sets of interviews he did with a group of farmers, and he, the translator says that as he readily admits, even though he had known the farmers he interviewed for a long time, Pierre Bourdieu did not really hear what these men were saying until a number of years later, after he had transcribed the conversation and listen to it carefully, repeatedly, and especially differently. That commitment to listening is not in the way we design our systems for understanding how society works. It's not in the way we develop our official statistics. When we worked on the Need to Know project, a joint project with the Statistics Authority, the House Commons Library, the ESRC last year, trying to ask the question of what information don't we have about society that we need to make the decisions of the next few years, Jane Elliott, who was CEO of the ESRC at that time, was absolutely committed to how do we go and ask the public what they want to know. I would like to see more of our leaders asking that question. How do we listen better when we make these choices about how to measure our society. And that brings me on to my third uh, challenge, which is we undervalue communication and communication skills and resourcing communication. People who know what they're talking about punch far below their weight in public debate, including statisticians, including academics. Economists are having a rough time of it, although economists claim to know what they're talking about has also had a rough time of it in recent years. Senior people in some of our leading think tanks have asked me whether the public have simply given up on experts, and not occasionally. It's been the refrain for the last couple of years. It's in much easier, both in the data and in my experience, to make the case that experts have given up on the public. One shining exception to that is Paul Johnson, the thoughtful leader of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who was far, first off a mark post referendum in an unrelenting article headlined, We Economists Must Face the Plain Truth That the Referendum Showed Our Failings. He argued, we need to understand the abject failure of our profession to persuade the public about the consequences of a leave vote, which he took as obvious were economically negative. Again, it is always a mistake simply to look at the media as a scapegoat for real failings were with my profession. Again, let me be clear, I am blaming us, the economists, for failing to communicate basic economic concepts to politicians, journalists, and business people, never mind the public. The second failing, he says, is lack of leadership. The third failing is our collective lack of speed, agility, and focus on issues of overwhelming importance. Finally, he says, perhaps there is the language we use. Who cares about the economy, growth, trade, if we can't translate them directly into incomes, jobs, living standards? We must start speaking more plainly. 
And we must also link these things to real people, to the poor, to those in the middle, to parents, to families, to workers and to pensioners. This is the kind of leadership, servant leadership, that holds the possibility of redeeming the service that experts should provide to the public. I was inspired to read that from Paul. I think it's an enormously important challenge to all of us. I admire him very much for the speed and clarity of that analysis and his determination to take responsibility. And the only thing I would add to what Paul has said is that his diagnosis is almost entirely about talking. And I think to meet his challenge of understanding the abject failure of our experts to persuade the public, we need to do more listening. In marketing, there are four Ps, product, price, promotion, place. The first is product. It's about understanding what the market wants from you, listening to people and bringing that market research back into your business. I remember having this conversation with the Public Administration Select Committee and Cheryl Gillen, MP, who was a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, suggested that actually what I was arguing was we need better market research for government. And I think she was right. And she said that presumably would inform policy making much better if there was that interrogative process that went with market research. Plus also it might increase the satisfaction ratings of the public in how they perceive the operation of government. Which sounds like a prize worth going for. And if you apply that also to experts who are currently at best shooting in the dark with a lot of the work they're doing, isn't it about time we had proper research into what the public wants from experts? And actually, we assisted experts to provide that. Where are our research councils? Where is the Office for National Statistics? Where are the bodies charged with informing the public in doing the research to understand what the public wants? Because full fact would want to use that research, and many other bodies would too. It seems inexplicable to me that the professions that centre on research and rigorous understanding seem indifferent to it when it comes to communicate their work. Whereas advertisers famously say, we prefer the discipline of knowledge to the anarchy of ignorance. Researchers can't live up to that standard. Finally, on those four challenges, we undervalue teamwork. Um, I've spent the last eight years offering answers, not questions, and often 30-second answers to the most complex social issues. That must be done, and it must be done as well as it possibly can, because the sacrifice of not doing it is far more than the sacrifice of doing it. But to everybody whose research they feel I have butchered over those years, my sincere apologies. I'm doing it with the best of intentions. And to get that 30 seconds, to get that final sentence, is the ultimate act of teamwork. It probably starts with somebody who has spent a lifetime building expertise and then talking to other people who have learned from that expertise and right down through until some journalist who's on the night shift at 3 a.m. is trying to sum it up in a headline. And I suspect the person who's given their life to it will always be dissatisfied. But the better we can join up that queue, the better for all of us. As an outsider, that teamwork seems less prized in the social sciences than in the hard sciences. But when I see the research communication that really works, I see teamwork everywhere I look. When I went to the 50th anniversary of the Outstanding Institute for Fiscal Studies, Andrew Dilmont spoke there, brilliant leader of the IFS, and he was at pains to point to its research director, Richard Blundell, as the man who kept it all together. None of these institutions is actually about an individual. A newer team on the block, the Migration Observatory, has been the meshing of outstanding Oxford academics with outstanding former journalists in their communications team to make that work. And even more recently, the UK and a Changing Europe project, probably the most successful academic informing the public startup there ever has been, has worked because it has been a team of academics working with communicators as a team. And it has been an extraordinary success. The pattern is consistent. It is the best of research meeting the best of communication. And yet the funders don't get it. This is not something our research councils prize or support, nor do they realise that these teams only work if they work in the long run. It takes 50 years to make an institute for fiscal studies. You get five years funding out of a research council and you count yourself lucky. And while I'm talking about teams, I uh, just want to quickly say 
it's a very kind introduction, but Full Fact is a team. It's been a team from day one. It's been a team actually led by Michael Samuel, who is here today, our chairman, um, who made it possible to start Full Fact, provided the seed funding, who encouraged the charitable funders, and whose credibility brought the other trustees on board. It is a team still today. We have a leadership team of five people on the staff, um, every one of whom has an international reputation, and four out of five of those international reputations were earned at Full Fact. They're an extraordinary team. I could point especially to Joe and Phoebe, the linchpins of our analytical quality and our communication skills over the last few years, of Amy, who led our, our uh, editorial team <laughs> through some very tough times, and uh, Mevan, who created our automated fact-checking team. If you believe that any expert organization you see as the bloke in a suit you find on the telly, you are seriously misunderstanding how we solve the problem of misinformation. And so, I'll leave you with two very quick thoughts. Um, one is a statement that a cabinet minister made apparently describing his colleague's approach to Brexit as a theoretical exercise in which you take decisions over the lives of people in imagined worlds this week. Also this week, as former chief of defence staff saying, the defence programme we have is unaffordable. We are living a lie. We are living in an age of placebo politics, of imaginary cures to imaginary diseases. And that is very dangerous. After every election I've worked on, every expert group in immigration, in health, in the economy has said the party's manifestos bore no relation to reality. Quote the IFS at the last election, the shame of the two big parties' manifestos is that neither sets out an honest set of choices. We do not currently have the tools in our toolkit as expert organisations, as statisticians, to challenge the simple failure to engage with the real world. Part of that toolkit has to be about collaboration. We need to start thinking urgently about how we build the tools and the collaborations to challenge this placebo politics. And finally, uh, the hopeful note, the long-term solution. We all know that the solution is education. Tim Harford has written thoughtfully and persuasively about how the kind of education we need to provide people with is not skills, although certainly we need better skills. It's not knowledge, it's curiosity is getting people to think differently about the information we hear and process it differently. And I think he's got a point, and I would push it just slightly further, which is everything we are learning about how people work and how societies think is pushing us to the conclusion that we need to educate people to be much more self-aware about how we process information. And so, as well as curiosity, it's almost self-defense about our tendency to mislead ourselves. And I would like to see us push the question of how do we educate ourselves in that self-defense for our own thoughts. These are very big issues. You've been very patient. Um, thank you for your time. And remember, there is a long road ahead of us. And we are actually on the cusp of a massive explosion in the information we have in public life. It will either be owned by the government for the public benefit or by others. It will either be run for the public benefit or not. It will either be used in the service of our fellow man or not. And all of us are players in that game. All of us are actors with responsibility for making those choices right. I'm very proud to lead an organization which is absolutely committed to providing the best possible information in the deepest service of the public. I'm very proud to have worked with the Royal Statistical Society on that for years now. Uh, we have a lot still to do together. Thank you so much. Um, well, what, a, what, a, what an honour and a privilege to hear that and being challenged so much, you know, whatever area we work in, um, to have our ways of thinking uh, laid bare and, and really taken apart. Um, I, I feel very humbled by the whole thing. Um, I, we've got some time for questions. Actually, I didn't introduce myself, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm the one at the bottom of the list. <laughs> uh, David Spiegelholt, I'm president of the Royal Statistical Society. I've even got the gong to prove it. They've allowed me to wear it briefly. Um, so uh, we've got some time for questions, which I will try to um, harness. And so, um, and there are some microphones going around. Have we got? How many microphones? Got one. Okay. So if you put your hands up, and if you put your hand up, I can start ordering you as well. So, um, but we'll start at the back. Yeah. If you could say who you were. Uh, I'm Tim Harford from the Financial Times. Thank you, Will. It's wonderful. You said that 
the uh, governments choose ignorance when they don't have to. And I was wondering why you thought that was. Is it the Dunning-Kruger effect? They, they don't know how little they know? Is it strategic, that they don't want to know the truth? Or is there something else going on? Uh, um, I think the biggest single reason is that if this generation of permanent secretaries decided to change that, they would see none of the benefits. We need the leaders of the government to decide to do something that only their successors will benefit from. Um, and that's a tough ask, understandably, when there are always competing pressures. I think we failed to make the case. The idea that £18 million to get decent crime data is not an obviously good uh, idea is extraordinary. So we've utterly failed to make the case of a value for money or better information about value for money. Um, and yes, there is an element, and people have said this to me frankly, of if we really understood the costs of government policy choices and who they fell on, that would make politics much more difficult. And so we have to win that argument or overcome it too. Fiona Fox from the Science Media Centre. Uh, yes, thanks. That was absolutely brilliant. Loads of food for thought. Um, I was struck by your early point about the simplicity of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and how powerful that is. Um, you found those bits of the process that you can intervene in and make a difference. I love that. But then the rest of the speech was much more intractable, big problems. And I actually don't know to what extent full facts tackles those. So you've, you've laid them out. Do you lobby? Do you meet with the research councils? Do you meet with ministers? Um, I know you lobbied around PERDA. I know you did a joint letter, which was brilliant. But, but and, and, and is anyone listening to it? How is that bit of it going? Or do you feel like you had to wait your eight years of doing the simple stuff and establishing an incredible reputation for doing that well before you had the influence to, to change things? I do think that at our best, full facts work is drawing on the specific evidence from specific fact checks. If I tell you that UCAS's data is horrific to use, it's because I have seen my colleagues tear their hairs out at UCAS data. So it tells us the simple places where we can change things. But I think it's then important to bring that evidence, which is unique, that's not coming from anywhere else, to the attention of those who can make decisions to make our world a better place. So when the Leveson inquiry happened, Full Fact was actually a very young organisation. We didn't have an established reputation at that point. And yet we provided over about 100 pages of examples of stories in the media that had been wrong and what had happened when we asked for corrections. We didn't offer that much in the way of commentary. We certainly didn't tell uh, the inquiry what the answer was. But we provided the evidence that helped them make their mind up what they said a comprehensive and extremely useful submission. Um, so we're about providing information, providing ideas, but the thoughts I shared on misinformation are partly based on conversations we have had with several different branches of government. So we engage with people who are willing to engage with us, and sometimes we engage with people who aren't willing to engage with us. Um, the Daily Mail did not set up a corrections column because it loved us. Um, it set up a corrections column because the argument for doing so became overwhelming. Um, but yeah, it's something that we value. We now have a policy officer who is dedicated to doing that work, and our head of communications, Phoebe, has led that work for a long time. Um, and one thing that has been proven around the world is that simply publishing fact checks is not a sufficient way of making a difference in the world. We look for every bit of leverage we can get. Hey, Will, thank you. That was, that was brilliant, really interesting. I'm Vanessa from the UK Statistics Authority, so we're thinking uh, a lot about the sort of problems you described. I was interested if you had any more thoughts on kind of the balance between really, really granular data um, and a headline figure. So I don't think any of us would argue about the fact that we need to do more to provide people with a connection to statistics, um, to see the statistics in their own lives. But I think if you push it to its extreme, you end up with everybody feeling their own truths. Yeah. And when I'm making decisions, I'm wondering how important is it that I understand my own situation in the context of something broader? Yeah. It's, it's a really good and a really tough question. And one of the bits I cut because I didn't want to try your patience any further was a, a defence that 
whereas you know giants like beverage have offered us answers all i'm trying to do at this stage is ask questions there's a lot more wisdom in this room than i have to offer but to take something like inflation you know when we adjust public spending for inflation and it's specifically about health the knowledge that inflation is different in the healthcare system but prices change differently in the healthcare system we know that there are lots of places where we're not being granular enough what we don't know is how we co communicate complexity better and when we can get rid of it and again that's because we are not studying this where is the audience research that would tell us if you want to fly blind in doing this work go ahead personally i say let's do the audience research and then we'd know a bit more Sumay Thompson from Media Trust. Will, that was brilliant. I'm really sorry I missed the first 20 minutes. I hope there's a transcript somewhere. Um, my question is this. So two nights ago, Carol Cadwallader of The Observer won the Orwell Prize for her reporting into Cambridge Anal Analytica. And during her acceptance speech, she alluded to having received threats, being intimidated, and so on. Has that happened to you? How brave do you have to be to do the work that you're doing? A hell of a lot less brave than if I was a woman in this job. Thanks for that, Will. I have to say it was probably worth missing the Brazil game for, uh, <laughs> which is praise I indeed. No, you don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Arnon Menon from uh, King's College. I, I buy the points made by Paul Johnson and Aldi Han, Hal, Andy Haldane, which are similar points in a different way, that we fail to communicate to many people in our society uh, how society works, what's happening with things like the economy. But the question I have, I suppose, is how do you remedy that? Because part of the problem, and part of the problem we face, is if you try and do communication with the general public, it's only parts of the general public that turn out. Uh, and it might be that there's a certain section of society that is probably rightly suspicious of aggregate data, but how do you address the fact that it is a real struggle communicating with those people? I mean, does, is it something that needs to be fixed by our school system, or is it something that experts are failing at? Um, experts are failing, obviously. Um, and at the same time, that's an extremely unfair way of putting it, which is that to be an expert in political science or political economy or law and an expert in communication is asking rather a lot. To be a communicator in those things is much more feasible. And this is why I go back to the notion of teams. We need to bring together academic experts and communications experts, which, by the way, is our last two questioners, to work together to do this. Uh, David alluded to the fact that I'm a Marketing Academy scholar. I have far more credentials, and those limited enough, as a communicator um, than I do as an analyst. And actually, full facts work even with a brilliant but small team of analysts we have, is made possible by our links to expert bodies like UK and a Changing Europe, like the Institute for Fiscal Studies, like the Nuffield Trust, um, who provide much deeper subject specialism. At the same time, I think we help them reach audiences and communicate messages that they would find harder to do. I think if we can resource the full team, possibly in separate organizations. I'm agnostic about that. But if we can resource the full spectrum of how we communicate expertise, then we can do this well. But if the game is always going to be go and get a PhD and somewhere figure out how to do marketing too, then we're surely in the wrong game. Hi, uh, Bobby Duffy from Ipsos Murray again. Absolutely brilliant one. I loved the beginning with the optimistic view of we're getting maybe to a brow of a hill. To say, I'm just slightly worried what's over the hill, personally. <laughs> um, so it's, it's related to that, just in terms of from a misinformation point of view. And the principles-based approach seems exactly right, because the most worrying thing is not in the individual uh, capability, it's the accelerating pace of change. So in terms of what's, what's possible to do in a misinformation environment that, that we've got now. So do you, do you believe that principles-based approach can work in such a fast-changing environment? Do you think we can actually come up with something that can nail that down? In 2003, um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords got together to pass the Communications Act in 2003 which did not mention the internet. I think if we're going to take a shot at right now, 
we're definitely going to miss. So I think the principles-based approach is hard. I think the human fertilization and embryology approach is a shining example of how it can be done well, but Mary Warnock was a genius working with a fantastic committee that turned into a very carefully crafted piece of legislation that presumably turned into a very carefully run regulator at the end of that. It took an awful lot of things to go right for that to work. So I'm not saying that by any means, if we go for that, we'll necessarily pull it off. But I do know that if we take pot shots at right now, we are going to be fighting the battle from five years ago. And actually, the conversations I hear all the time are people and policymakers gearing up to fight the last war on this subject. Unless we get, uh, get to grips with the principles and the capabilities instead of just what tools on your daughter's smartphone right now, um, we're just never going to be in this game the right way. Okay, I'm going to draw it close to that now and invite you all to go downstairs to the council chamber where refreshments will be provided. So it just leaves uh, me to thank Will. Um, can we just thank him one more time? I'm not going to stop there. Just, just, just because it suddenly struck me that, you know, I mentioned Beveridge, you know, creating his report in the middle of 1942, the depths of the war, you know, which we weren't at all sure what was going to happen, and yet he had this foresight to look forward and to work on principles and in, in the way that, that Will is pointing forward. And I think exactly the same that Will has taken. It would have been dead easy for him just to have come on, moaned on about Trump and other... We didn't even hear the word. And, and just to deal with what to us seems to be these immediate problems just coming at us, right, left and centre. And yet he stood back and given us enormous perspective, depth and length to make us all consider our role in, in this work. And uh, I think we have to be really grateful to him for providing us with that. So, thank you very much again. <laughs>